This week on Christian World News, War of Extinction. ISIS is kidnapping and killing Christians. We'll tell you how the church is enduring this trial by fire. Plus, radical Islam is spreading beyond just the Middle East. How terror groups like Boko Haram are taking over West Africa. And a filmmaker's decade-long journey to find the truth behind one of the Bible's most famous stories. ISIS militants are taking Christians hostage in Syria. Welcome to this week's edition of Christian World News. I'm George Thomas. My colleague Wendy Griffith is on assignment. The jihadist army known as ISIS has raided at least 33 Assyrian villages, taking as many as 300 hostage. Humanitarian organizations confirm reports that ISIS has been targeting Assyrian Christians. It began as the militants suffered two major setbacks on the battlefield. Gary Lane has details. The Iraqi military hailed its important victory this week against the Islamic State. ISIS forces were routed from al-Baghdadi, a city west of Baghdad that they've held since last June. But al-Baghdadi was not the only town of defeat for the ISIS forces. Peshmerga troops in northeastern Syria, known as the YPG, drove Islamic State militants from the Kurdish city of Tal Tamar. But as they retreated, the ISIS jihadists kidnapped Assyrian Christians. The men were taken to an undisclosed location, the women to a nearby mountain. Based on their past actions, ISIS may behead the abducted men and use the women as sex slaves. Juliana Tamarazzi is with the Assyrian Philos Project. These women were sobbing, saying, what is our fault? Why is the West silent? Why is the church not talking about our persecution? And they're asking, they're questioning the foreign policy of America and also other world powers in Europe, saying why is it that there's nothing, there's no agenda, there's really nothing that is being done to help the persecuted in the Middle East. U.S. wake up! U.S. wake up! A group of Egyptian-American Coptics gathered near the White House Tuesday, demanding that the Obama administration do more to protect Egyptian, Syrian, and Iraqi Christians. The Obama administration uh, didn't make a clear statement that these individuals were killed for their faith. They actually referred to them in their White House statement as Egyptian citizens, and that's very disappointing to the Coptic community. Brotherhood, ISIS, Boko Haram, I want to take action against them instead of support them. And Egyptian President al-Sisi is calling for a united Arab military force to combat ISIS. And al-Sisi says already Jordan and the United Arab Emirates have offered to help Egypt on the battlefield. Gary Lane, CBN News. Thanks, Gary. By the way, Gary also spoke with Tom Doyle, vice president of E3 Partners Ministry and author of the new book, Killing Christians, Living the Faith Where It's Not Safe to Believe. Gary asked about Tom about these and the most recent atrocities. This is disturbing. What have you learned about the abduction this week of those Christians in Syria? Well, you know, some of our leaders in uh, Syria uh, have family members that were taken. And uh, the latest that we received this morning is that ISIS has announced that they're going to burn 30 villages to the ground. We don't know if they'll follow up on that, but we already know of some killings happening. Uh, but we're praying that the church and the world cries out for these lives. It's one to 200 that are taken. It's a terrible tragedy. And, and when you say we know of some killings, are you talking about the Christians that have been killed that we can confirm or others in the area? That's what one of our leaders in Syria said. Now, they have trouble getting the news sometimes, and, and um, so he was mentioning that they knew of seven were killed. I haven't heard that confirmed internationally yet, but that's what they've heard. And he is right in the middle uh, uh, of those villages and hearing things just on the ground. And Tom, why did you write your latest book, Killing Christians? I'm sure the spiritual had a lot to do with it. Well, you know, it's it's really about the situation, Gary, is that they're killing Christians in the Middle East. And really, it's a global epidemic. It's pandemic. It's all around us. But I wanted to tell the stories about those that are living in the midst of this danger. I really do think, Gary, some of the people in, in this book of Hebrews 11 was being written today, they might be contained in it, standing, serving Christ, sharing the gospel in the midst of ISIS. Uh, I was just praying for one of our leaders the other day in Syria who is sharing the gospel with an ISIS man that is privately 
frustrated with what he's doing. It's just a job for him. And he's open to the gospel. So we know that none are unreachable. They're serving Christ faithfully in the front lines and their lives will inspire you. And Tom, I'm sure you've met a number of the Yazidis as have I. Uh, they're really open to the gospel there as are many of the Kurds. Uh, finally, how should we be praying for them? Uh, not only about ISIS, but for the, the unsaved and also for the saved, the Middle East Christians. Well, you know, I think Satan is, is not stupid. And he knows that in the last 10 years, more Muslims have come to faith than in the last 14 centuries of Islam. So if he can keep, keep Christians in fear of Muslims or angry at them, hateful, thinking that every one of them serves for ISIS, you know, works with ISIS, this horrible terrorist group, then we'll stay away. So he is not only trying to cause global chaos, but he's trying to keep the church, the believers, from bringing the light into this darkness. So we ask first that believers would start praying. Once we start praying, we have heart surgery. We have a change, and God starts to do things in our mind and in our heart for the believers out there and for those that are even unsaved. And Tom, Bill O'Reilly has Killing Kennedy, Killing Lincoln. You have Killing Christians. Thanks so much. We'll look forward to reading that book. And thanks for joining us again. Thank you, Gary. Tom Doyle had much more to say about the state of Christians in Syria and Iraq. You can see the full interview at our website, cbnnews.com. By the way, ISIS is also trying to erase biblical history in Iraq. A new video shows Islamic State militants destroying ancient artifacts in, the muse in a museum in the city of Mosul. This video released by ISIS shows militants using drills and sledgehammers to smash several statues and tablets. Many of those artifacts were part of the Christian heritage of that area. Mosul is sent, set on ancient Nineveh, the burial place of the prophet Jonah. In Nigeria, the armed men who abducted an American missionary this week are demanding a ransom of nearly $300,000. Phyllis Sorter was abducted from her Christian school's compound in the central part of that country. The Free Methodist Church says the State Department and FBI are working with Nigerian authorities to find her. Family and friends say Sorter understood the risks of working in a country known for Islamic terrorism. The radical Islamic terrorist group Boko Haram is waging a holy war in Africa in places like Nigeria. And like ISIS in the Middle East, they're trying to establish their own caliphate, a modern Islamic state. In the dusty cities of countries in West Africa, there's growing anxiety over the spiritual and territorial ambitions of the radical Islamic group Boko Haram. For years, Boko Haram focused on Nigeria, but now they are creating chaos across the region. We need to find a way to get rid of them before it gets worse. Boko Haram is trying to create what's called a caliphate across Western Africa, similar, in fact, to what the Islamic State in Syria is trying to do. And today, the violence in Nigeria is spilling across its borders into Cameroon, Chad and Niger. Those four countries, plus Benin, have formed a regional military force. In recent days, they've killed hundreds of Islamic fighters and recaptured several towns. Still, in places like southeast Niger, where Americans Neil and Danette Childs have planted several churches, thousands of people, including Christians, are still fleeing the militants' reign of terror. Christians are having to leave. Um, I mean, it's a serious situation. It's a serious situation. Uh, right now, as we speak, there's people on the road headed west to get away from Boko Haram. Boko Haram started in 2002. Their goal? Turn Nigeria, Africa's top oil producer and biggest economy, into an Islamic state ruled by Sharia law. Boko Haram is a jihadist movement that has the same ideology as all other Salafi jihadists, as Al-Qaeda, as the Taliban, as Al-Shabaab. What they want to do is to establish an emirate, an Islamist radical state, first in the northern part of Nigeria, and then push to the south and declare an emirate across Nigeria. Since then, their fighters have killed thousands of people. In 2014 alone, Boko Haram reportedly murdered more than 2,400 Christians.
These are ruthless people who don't have any respect for religion, Christian or Muslim. They kill indiscriminately. They are evil. And now some intelligence officials worry the group could not only expand their attacks beyond this region, they could become the ISIS of Africa. Boko Haram has repeatedly praised ISIS's apocalyptic Islamic ideology. But increasingly, U.S. counterterrorism officials fear a possible tactical and operational alliance between the two groups as well. If that happens, it could give radical Islam an even bigger and growing foothold in both the Middle East and Africa. And that is one thing most folks are very, very concerned about. Please continue to pray, not just for the Christians in the Middle East, but also for Christians in Nigeria and in neighboring countries. Okay, so coming up, the dangers of standing up for the Jewish state. Why these Christians believe their love for Israel will bring persecution. I'm Terry Newsom. Did you know there are more than 148 million orphans in the world today? 148 million. But it was three little girls that taught me about the plight of orphans. Eight years ago, my husband and I spent nearly a month immersed in the daily activities of a Ukrainian orphanage as we waited to adopt three sisters. I saw firsthand the utter loneliness, the pain of rejection, and the overwhelming desire to be loved. That experience changed me forever. And out of it grew a ministry from my heart called Orphan's Promise. Today, we're helping orphans and vulnerable children in more than 50 countries worldwide. Thousands of children are now in safe homes. They're being educated and they're learning life skills. I'm asking you to join with me and become family to these children. Will you call the number on your screen right now? Because every child deserves a chance to be happy. Inside every child is a hero, a leader, a friend to others, someone who helps out, who does the right thing, who dreams of what they can be, but they still need our help. What should I do? What should I say? How should I feel? That's where Superbook comes in. It provides moral and spiritual truths through situations children can relate to, teaching God's Word to the children you love. Join the Superbook DVD Club and receive Superbook's newest episodes as they're available, plus two copies to share with others, all for your gift of only $25. Get Superbook today and watch the miracles happen. And welcome back to Christian World News. More than half of Jewish students in U.S. colleges report they have seen incidents of anti-Semitism on their campuses. That's the finding of a survey just released by Trinity College and the Brandeis Center. The survey shows the trend is nationwide with anti-Semitism on campus reported in every region of the country. Jewish men have traditionally been the chief targets of hate, but it's women who feel more vulnerable now, with nearly 60% saying they've witnessed or experienced anti-Semitism. At a Washington conference on, on extremism last week, President Obama claimed the world's terror threats were not rooted in Islam. But at another conference in Colorado, Christians and Jews heard a very different message to stand firm in the face of growing persecution. John Wagi has more. The president sees the terrorist threat as a law enforcement problem, a battle with difficult rogues of all faiths, not a civilizational war. The notion that the West is at war with Islam is an ugly lie. And all of us, regardless of our faith, have a responsibility to reject it. But his remarks come as much of the globe is engulfed in a growing flood of hatred for Jews and persecution of Christians, much of it coming from the Muslim world. That includes terror groups like ISIS, who have founded an Islamic empire, and Iran, whose leaders have preached the extermination of Israel for decades. One Jerusalem pastor, Wayne Hilsden, says Christians and Jewish believers in Jesus must speak up and brace for fierce opposition. How many of you know that the more hatred comes against the Jewish people, those who stand with them in their time of trouble will also be hated. We will also be slandered. We will also be lied against and falsely accused. It just goes with the package. At a summit this month in Colorado, Hillsden launched a group called FIRM, 
the Fellowship of Israel-related ministries. The goal is for believers to learn from the book of Daniel, to be aware of the times we're in, and to take a stand, regardless of what it costs, we'll be and to do it in love. This is one of the most intimidating times in history when the attacks of the enemy can spread like wildfire around the world and never eradicated. And when we are attacked, we will be attempted to attack, to attack our accusers in return. But when we stand firm, let us be like Daniel and not return evil for evil. Let's love our enemies. Messianic Jewish leader Jonathan Burnus says fundamental Islam is the carrier of the new anti-Semitism and Christians won't be spared in the spiritual battle that is upon us. I think that the, the answer for uh, the Muslim world is the same as the answer for the Jewish world, and his name is Yeshua, Jesus. The leaders say there's a special calling for young people who respond better to support of Israel and the Jews when they understand the character of God's name is at stake. Because God's covenant is endures forever because God's covenant is everlasting, because he's a faithful God, because the calling and the gifts of God are irrevocable. That's why we stand with Israel. John Wagi, CBN News. Up next, the documentary that's being called a game changer. Check out the evidence for Exodus right up. Hello, is this thing on? Hey kids, do you love Discovering things. Yeah. Well, do you? Yeah. Then you're gonna love this. It's the new free Superbook Kids Bible app. You can play games, watch videos, find answers to your questions, and a whole lot more. The new Superbook Kids Bible app. Free downloads available on iTunes and Google Play now. Hello, I'm Terry Newsom. Did you know there are more than 148 million orphans in the world today? 148 million. But it was three little girls that taught me about the plight of orphans. Eight years ago, my husband and I spent nearly a month immersed in the daily activities of a Ukrainian orphanage as we waited to adopt three sisters. I saw firsthand the utter loneliness, the pain of rejection, and the overwhelming desire to be loved. That experience changed me forever. And out of it grew a ministry from my heart called Orphan's Promise. Today, we're helping orphans and vulnerable children in more than 50 countries worldwide. Thousands of children are now in safe homes. They're being educated and they're learning life skills. I'm asking you to join with me and become family to these children. Will you call the number on your screen right now? Because every child deserves a chance to be happy. Pentecost 2015, from the corners of the earth, believers gather in Jerusalem, walk where Jesus walked, pray in Gethsemane, rejoice at the empty tomb, don't miss messages from over 100 world-renowned speakers and a score of popular worship artists. For more information and to register for the Empowered 21 Global Congress, go to Jerusalem2015.com. This May, Jerusalem. More than a decade ago, a movie maker started investigating one of the Bible's most famous stories, the Exodus from Egypt. Well, his journey led to both a crisis of faith and an award-winning documentary. Chris Mitchell brings us that story from Jericho. This is from the film Patterns of Evidence, The Exodus. According to the book of Exodus, Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt and into the wilderness for 40 years. Then Joshua led them across the Jordan River over here near Jericho into the Promised Land. Some say it's just a fable, but others say this new documentary provides evidence that demands a verdict. I actually went to the location where the events were supposed to happen in Goshen in the Eastern Delta and I uh, went to the archeological sites and that's what I was told, that there was no evidence for the Exodus. Filmmaker Tim Mahoney's research into the Exodus and the odyssey that followed produced startling results. Six steps in the right sequence and we matched the story of the Bible every six in all the steps and uh, shows evidence for the Bible that people have never seen before. The film proposes that when you get the timing right, archeology span matches history. 
The whole thing, from the beginning of the sojourn in, in, in Egypt, the slavery, Moses and the Exodus, the conquest of the Promised Land, is all there in one nice, neat line, but it's way too early. You look for a collapse in Egyptian civilization, and that's where you'll find Moses and the Exodus. When you put those cities side by side, the biblical account and the archaeology match extremely well. There's this idea that Ramesses is the Pharaoh, the Exodus, and I think that that happens in a particular time of history. And when everyone looks at that particular time, they're actually correct that there is no evidence for the Exodus. But other archaeologists and Egyptologists were saying, but wait a minute, there are evidences that are earlier than Ramesses that match this story. Mahoney presents both sides of the archaeological argument did the exodus really happen? I hate to disappoint people, but we have no evidence for a single mass migration of people from one country coming into another country. I don't believe there was a single event that we can call the exodus. This person can't have seen all this. He imagined it. I'm very much against chronological revisionism. So far, there is no documented evidence about the exodus. Exodus did not happen in the way that it is described in the text. How can we prove that? The film is very, very convincing because we give both sides of it. We let you hear from archaeologists who say there is no evidence and why, and then we let you hear from archaeologists and Egyptologists who say there is. Using state-of-the-art animation, groundbreaking archaeology, and new interpretation, it's already made a profound impact. We would show these films to people who had no understanding or interest in the story. Even atheists saw it. And what they said was, wow. Uh, I love this film, I love this approach. One atheist wrote, I guess you did prove that, you know, this event might have happened, but it doesn't mean that there were any miracles. An e, an a, and an L. Israel. Israel. Mahoney says it's a powerful tool to reach the skeptic. If you've got family members that don't believe in God or if you have people that, that are suspicious or want a scientific approach, this film gives you that type of opportunity to have those kinds of um, conversations. It's one of the most neutral and more, most intriguing types of films that allow you to have that opportunity. The film challenges a powerful notion that the Bible isn't true. For the last 50, 60, 70 years, people have been very critical of the Bible. If the story of the Exodus isn't true, then uh, what Jesus Christ said in, in the apostles about Moses and the Exodus, then those statements are false. Uh, the whole Bible is, has a foundation within this story of the Exodus. What this film does is that it actually shows where the pattern of evidence is, and uh, that, I think, has never been done before. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jericho. Come on, Give me guy. that. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Ah, sure, life is busy, but I found a way to make a huge difference in people's lives. I guess you could say I'm changing the world right here from home. I bring medical supplies and doctors to people in need. And dig wells so that villagers can have clean and safe water to drink. I make it possible to preach the gospel in over a hundred countries, including right here in America. And when disaster strikes, I'm there providing food thank you, and emergency supplies to give people hope again. Every day, CBN and I are making the world a better place. Here you go. My life is hectic, so I joined CBN through Pledge Express. My bank does all the work, and I know that my gift is being used where it's needed most. So become a CBN partner and join Pledge Express, because you can do a world of good right from where you are. Hi, good morning. Are you ready to get started? Pat Robertson recently recorded a very special program to answer the question, does God still heal today? What we're trying to do here, Scott, is to tell people how they can access the power of the living God through Jesus Christ. Discover the answers and let your faith be encouraged. And then Jesus spelled out of how we can have healing and how we can have miracles. In Pat Robertson's latest DVD, Be Healed, you'll learn the biblical basis for healing today, how to exchange anxiety and worry for faith and confidence, the way to pray for your healing and healing for those you love. Plus, meet real people who've experienced the miraculous healing power of God. The first thing I did was reached out for a lifesaver. 
and that was God. You know, you can put your trust in medicine, but the ultimate healing is gonna have to be God. Find out the biblical principles that lead to healing in Pat Robertson's latest teaching, Be Healed, available now. And welcome back to the broadcast. An American missionary who contracted Ebola six months ago in Liberia has recovered. Well, now she's heading back to the West African nation. Nancy Wrightball and her husband David told CBN News they, quote, feel led to return and do all they can to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Beautiful. The Right Balls work with SIM, International Mission Organization. Nancy contracted Ebola last summer, helping doctors disinfect medical equipment. Finally, on the broadcast this week, the Watoto Children's Choir out of Uganda has a mission to help and support the estimated 50 million orphans across Africa. Members of the choir say singing is only part of their purpose. Charlene Aaron recently caught up with the amazing choir in Norfolk, Virginia. The songs of Africa rang out across Norfolk, Virginia. Brightly clad members of the Watoto Children's Choir, all orphans, sang songs of praise and danced while sharing personal stories of their lives in Uganda. Poverty, AIDS, war, and the horror of serving as child soldiers have taken a toll on these little lives. The choir got its start in 1994, and since then it has traveled all over the world to raise awareness about the plight of Africa's orphans. Each child in the choir has lost one or both parents or has been abandoned. All the children have suffered um, the pain of loss the pain of being rejected and abandoned or the pain of losing, you know, the, the only people that meant everything, mom and dad. Team leader Edwin Smith says Watoto's impact on its members is life-changing, something he has experienced firsthand because he too grew up singing with the choir. It was when I was on choir that I realized I could become anybody in the world. That was when my dream looked very bright like I, I could I could dream and I could tell you that today I'm actually living the dream that I had back then when I was in the choir. So it's a very um, mind opening platform for the children. What Toto means child in Swahili and it takes a holistic approach to helping Africa's most vulnerable children. Those rescued live in a Watoto village with homes, a new family and free education. But most important of all, they learn about the love of Jesus Christ. Nine-year-old Alan told us what life was like before Watoto took him in. It was bad. It was bad? Yes, Aunt. Why was it bad? I, don't, I didn't have where to sleep. Jesus, you're my home. The children have all learned that God has a good plan for their lives, something they want to share with others around the globe and back home. It has been nice and I love it when we sing and dance and people's lives get changed. I want to live in Uganda so that I could also change the country and it becomes a good country. Their songs highlight the hope of a future filled with joy and new purpose. When you see these children, they're no longer sad. They come from a sad past, but they are not sad anymore because when, when God is in it, it's not over. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. A great way to end the broadcast. Thank you so much for joining us this week. Until next week, goodbye and God bless you.